Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on cybersecurity and mitigating your company's digital risk. I'm Dee Bowers, and I'll be your moderator. So before we jump into the webinar, I'm just going to go over how to use your webinar pane. So on the right side of your monitor, you should see an orange arrow. Click that arrow, you'll be able to toggle the webinar train between the open and closed position. And then there's a small chat window. Feel free to enter your questions in throughout the presentation, and our presenters will answer those during our Q&A session as time allows. Now is a good time to also check your audio settings. If you're using your phone, please make sure you've checked the use phone call option. And then if you've logged in on your computer, please make sure you've checked the computer option. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy. Excellent. And good morning, everyone, and thanks for taking time out of your day to uh, to meet and uh, spend an hour learning about what's going on in the world of, world of cybersecurity and really hopefully take away some really practical things that you can do to um, to help protect your organization and advance your cybersecurity stance. Um, give you a little bit of, of my background, and then my co-presenter, Ryan Prindeville, will uh, give a little bit of his as well, and then we can dive right in. So as a partner at the firm, I lead what's called our Governance Risk and Compliance Practice, or GRC practice, um, a, a large portion of which is uh, working in the cybersecurity space, helping companies um, uh, determine what their, their path forward is from a cybersecurity perspective, what their current risk level is, um, and ultimately how you get a, a well-functioning program uh, put in place. And my personal background in security started back when I, I came out of college and was working at Deloitte in their enterprise risk services practice, and I was fortunate enough to have a mentor um, that was in the security services practice there, um, and I just found it fascinating that, I could, that you could be sitting at a machine um, at any given point in time, um, uh, potentially breaking into another device, um, whether it be mobile, laptop, server, et cetera, uh, on the other side of the world, uh, a lot of times without even uh, people knowing that you're doing it. The level of sophistication and the level uh, of knowledge that it took at the time to do that, to me, uh, was just fascinated by it. It really drew me into the space, and a lot has changed in, in the past 15 years as it relates to cyber, uh, but that's really what's drawn me in and really what, what makes me passionate about working with companies to help them protect themselves as it relates to cyber. So, Ryan, why don't we jump ahead and have you go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Hey, everybody. Ryan Prindeville here. I am the practice leader and for our strategy and transformation consulting business here, here within Armanino. And some of you might say, well, why, why does the strategy and transformation guy care about cybersecurity? And, and the number one, re number one reason I, I, I care about this is that when we're advising clients and helping clients assess their current state and develop, develop roadmaps for the future, whether it be looking at organization, whether it be looking at your core business processes or, or, or your technology lands landscape and ecosystem, one of the number one factors, external factors that, that all of our clients are facing today is cybersecurity. It is changing the way that we have to advise our clients and the way that we work with our, work with our clients on your roadmap, on your organization, on your strategy, and, and, it, and it, it has, has a broad-based broad impact. We're going to talk about some of those today. My, business, my, my background, I have been on the, on the management consulting and technology consulting uh, side for many years, but I started my side, my, my career back in, on the client side of the, of, of the table and have, have let, done many, many roles, including technology leadership roles in, in e-commerce and business-to-business, -business, uh, technology architecture roles, and uh, in, inter internal process improvement roles, leading, leading Six Sigma initiatives and lean, lean initiatives as well. So broad, broad, back, broad, broad background and now, and now driving strategy and, and transformation consulting. So looking forward to having this conversation with everybody today. Awesome. Well, let's dive in and talk about what we want to go ahead and cover here. You know, what we're going to go through today is we're going to give a little bit of a background on kind of what the landscape looks like, highlighting some recent breaches. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I've been in this space for quite a long time, uh, and if I were to back up to when, when I first started working in this space, it really was very much a Fortune 100, Fortune 500, big business kind of discussion. Um, Mid-market, small companies, um, not really as impacted uh, on, on a broad scale, and really everybody is at risk uh, today uh, with the advent of uh, uh, and, and the push to mobile, the push to the cloud, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are really accelerating the pace of of cybersecurity issues and risks within the or, uh, within uh, really just the world as a whole. Um, evaluating um, different uh, impacts is having on the various industries, as I mentioned, very very broad impact. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about what's driving this. Um, you know, we commonly refer to this as the malware economy. Um, we'll talk about the different types of hackers, whether it be kind of the technology geek or, in many cases, organized crime that operate uh, very much like a normal corporation that have help desks and um, sort of org charts and everything to go along with how they're going to be breaking into places. 
Um, we're going to talk about how do you put a holistic system in place. Um, we'll, we'll dispel one of the common fallacies about cybersecurity, which is it is just a technology uh, thing. It's only one piece of the puzzle. And then we're going to discuss some practical steps because it's one thing to hear about, hey, what does this program look like? But it may look and feel like you're going to be drinking from the fire hose. So how do you dissect that into the various pieces um, and, and put together a plan that is going to be actionable and realistic for an organization of your size? So let's go ahead and jump ahead here, Ryan. So where are companies falling short? Let's talk about a few of these, you know, and I could go on all day about some of the most recent breaches, but we wanted to highlight just, just a few. Um, you know, Yahoo in the top right, um, obviously being bought by Verizon Wireless. Um, Verizon asked for a $1 billion write down in the valuation because of the data breach that happened back in 2013. Um, it was a one billion accounts that were that were compromised. Um, the thing that most people don't, don't realize is it didn't stop in 2013 with that data breach. There were three more. The most recent being in December of of 2016, um, which you know is is not too too far in the rearview mirror. Um, at that point, an additional 500 million account credentials were compromised. So if you think about it, you know Yahoo's going through this process trying to to position themselves for sale. They are in a position to be acquired. They have a breach. You would think that that's really going to raise the, the sort of raise their game, if you will. Um, ferret out what the issues are. Um, put the appropriate security in place. Make sure this doesn't happen again, and it happened two more times. So it really shows. Number one, you have to maintain really, really strong vigilance. And this stuff can be difficult um, in the context of Yahoo. Um, you know, massive, massive enterprise, tons of devices, huge public-facing footprint. Um, really, really challenging there. On the bottom left side here um, is one that I found to be really interesting, which is a, a, an education platform called Edmodo, um, and 77 million accounts were, were stolen by a hacker. And the thing that's really interesting about this one is it's cited as the largest breach of children's data in history. Um, so if you think about it, it's a platform that uh, that K through 12 schools use to facilitate um, sort of their electronic classrooms, electronic blackboards, et cetera. And all of these accounts, um, majority of which are held by minors or compromised. So now we're not just going after um, you know, identities, credit cards, et cetera, of adults, but now we potentially have credentials uh, of minors as well. So that's where it's really, really interesting. It's starting to, a lot of these hacks are starting to filter into areas that, that previously uh, would not have been exposed uh, at the same level. And then on the bottom left here, the one that, that I find really, really interesting is uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. You know, you look at some of these government organizations that have very, very strong um, cybersecurity presence and, and sort of anti-crime uh, areas around uh, cybersecurity, and they're the ones being hacked. You know, it's the FBI, it's the CIA, it's the NSA. And the thing that's very, very interesting about the CIA, um, even going back to, um, to, to Edward Snowden, the most recent um, hack or data breach from the CIA was perpetrated in the same way that Snowden did. It was from a government contractor who uh, took data off of a government system in an unauthorized manner and then uh, made it made it publicly available. Um, so really, really interesting there. And then the top left, DLA Piper Ryan. I know you've got some background on this one. Perhaps you can share with us. Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good segue into the into the, into the next slide as well. Uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the reason is DLA Piper was hit, hit by a major m malware attack, and m many of you may know DLA Piper is one of the largest glo global law firms in the country. And we're going to talk a little bit about this in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But you, you as, a, as a company, you may look at this and say, "Say, hey, these are all these are all big companies, big entities. Why does this matter to me?" Why, why it matters to you is that your your security perimeter, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, doesn't just extend to yourself, but it extends to all your service providers as well. And and we're we're going to put forward kind of a, a tactical tac, tactical and practical approach to saying that you need to be looking at the the, the, the service providers and all the all the various pe people and, and and companies in your in your ecosystem as well to ensure you have a, you have a secure perimeter. Yep, absolutely. So when we talk about what's going on in the news. Back in May, many of you probably heard about the, the, this WannaCry wanna mal malware uh, virus that went, out, that went out and infected computers all over the world. Now, the truth is, is that now, a couple months later, it's, it's sort of a past story. No, it doesn't, doesn't really matter anymore, and, and, and we'll talk about that. But, but what, it did is, what it did prove is that a massive malware attack can affect hundreds and hundreds of companies around the world very, very rapidly, and even if the ransom... Uh, the ransomware engineers, the people who engineered the scheme, didn't. Maybe, maybe they only only achieved getting a hundred thousand dollars out of the ransomware. What the 
the challenge that it, that it shows is that companies can end up spending millions in recovering from the, from the scheme. So, so what, what, this, what this shows a few months later, is, is, and we'll talk about how you, how you avoid some of this going forward, is the, that even, even though the, the, the attack itself might not have been successful, which, what you have is, has, has, is, a, is a scenario that, that affected, com affected companies all, all over the world. So, so here, here's, what, here's what it was. This, this was, this was a, a malware attack that infected Windows operating systems. It demanded Bitcoin as payment to unlock encrypted files. It locked the files of the computers that, that, were, that, were, that were affected, and it infected numerous computers once it got, once it got into an, an organization quickly. So the, the truth is this was a relatively simple attack that could have been, could have been protected from in, 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 your, in your entities, assuming you ran your Windows updates, you had firewalls and antivirus software, you were, you were remaining wary when, when reading your emails, and regularly backing up your data. We're going to talk a little bit about why, how that is, and that how this is a technology challenge, but really this is an organizational people and process challenge just as much as it is a technology challenge. And that's a great point, Ryan. So let's go ahead and pause and uh, launch our first polling question here. We know it's early in the day. You guys are probably still, like me, having your coffee and, and getting fully caffeinated for the day, so we want to make sure you're paying attention. So let's dive into this first one. And it's, is cybersecurity a technology problem? Agree, disagree, or I don't know? And hopefully you guys were listening in my intro. I might have given you the answer to this one already. So let's go ahead and log your response. We'll wait for those to flow in. Uh, we're, we're, see, we're seeing responses pour in here. All right. Give it just another second. Here we go. So let's go ahead and look at the results here. 53% said, I agree, it is a technology problem. 45% said uh, they disagree, and 2% said, I don't know. Well, I can see here there's a little bit of ambiguity, perhaps, in the question if it was phrased, is it cybersecurity only a technology problem? I think the agree would be uh, much higher, and that's really the intent of the question here. At the end of the day, the fallacy that we're trying to point out here is so many organizations think cybersecurity is just a technology problem. If I had a better device at my perimeter catching, filtering emails, if I had better malware, if I had better this or better that, None of this stuff would happen. The reality is that's not true. There's many, many components to cybersecurity that are at play here. So let's dive back in and talk a little bit more about why this is getting such uh, such high profile. All right. So 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 one of the, one of the things that that you that many of you on the phone may, may be as Armenino clients and and friends of the firm, you may you may be in the finance finance organization. And you know why is this important to the finance finance organization? Well, the AICPA recently came out came out with, with, with some statements saying this is the number one number one challenge facing organizations this year and next year. And 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 here's a quote from Sue Coffee from from the AICPA from 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 a national event uh, last month, I believe. And, and and you know what what it's saying is that threat, threats are escalating. And they're coming in all different all different time, times and, 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 appro and approaches. And we really need to communicate as leaders across the organization to work to work on and fight them together. So how do we do that? And, and what is what does this what does this mean? All right. So 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 what what are the what are those issues? The issues issue number one fa facing organizations today, according to ASCPA again, is cybersecurity. Why? What is that? Common hacking risks. So Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned er, earlier, we hacking the organizations, credit card fraud from online contributions. Look, you know, looking at looking at at uh, means of, of stealing credit card numbers. That was historically the the, num the number one number one reason for doing it. But more and more, what we are seeing is. The types of data that are that are coming on are not just real, not just the real time credit card credit card challenges, but also looking at things like hospital, company, and healthcare data, patient data, all that HIPAA HIPAA protected data that that, or, that organizations has is just just as high of a high of a, a threat and and a, a value to potential cyber criminals. Yeah, and Ryan, and this is and, and this is. 
And I was just saying, I just wanted to interject. This is a really, really interesting point because historically, a lot of um, organizations raising sort of alarm around cybersecurity were were um, either government intelligence agencies or IT organizations. Um, various organizations focused on what's happening in in sort of the cyber threat space. The fact that the AICPA has come out and issued this follows on um, a report that came out from the Center for Audit Quality uh, about four years ago that said, hey, in the wake of the target breach, companies really need to think about cybersecurity as part of their financial accounting. And everybody kind of scratches their heads and said, well, how do you really connect the two? And they said, look, target should have known that it was such a large target, if you will, no pun intended, you're such a large target for credit card hackers, you should have known you were going to be breached at some time, it was reasonably likely, therefore you should have carried a liability for this. So the AICPA has looked at this not only from what is the cost of a breach um, for an individual organization across industries, etc., but how should we be accounting for them? And how should we be, be in turn protecting ourselves? So this is why it's really, really interesting and really profound that they came out, really one of the first organizations outside of either the government or the IT space to point out this is an area that, that companies need to wake up and pay attention to. It's a very, very good point, very good point. I think next we'll, we'll, we'll jump into our polling question number two. All right, well, that's coming up here. There we go. All right, next question then is, our company does not have anything a hacker would want. Please respond as either true or false. True is your company does not have anything a hacker would want. False, it, we absolutely do have something that, we, that they would want. All right. I think this one that we got a pretty clear answer. People are paying attention here. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something where even if you look at, at sort of the, the crown jewels, if you will, you know, Ryan was mentioning, you know, credit card data or now uh, healthcare data. Credit cards can be sold on the black market for anywhere between, you know, 2 and $8 uh, a pop. Healthcare records, if it includes social and uh, and address, can be sold for as high as $40 uh, per uh, uh, per record um, in, in the absence of something that is as monetized as credit cards or personal identities. Um, everybody, has, everybody uh, every company that has an internet connected device, meaning if you have a server connected, if you have a firewall, if you have laptops connected, you have something that, ha that hackers want. Number one, you have power, and number two, you have bandwidth. So even if they can't take something from you, they can launch an attack off of your devices. So there's always going to be something. If you are connected to the internet, you are at risk. So let's talk about who these people are that are breaking into, breaking into machines. You know, on the left side uh, of your screen, you see it's the technology geek. Um, it's individuals that um, have a high degree of sophistication, high degree of knowledge. Um, around technology and specifically how you can get out and troll through the internet and look for open ports and ways to get in. Um, the, as I mentioned, I was fortunate to have a mentor when I started my career that fit this mold exactly. Um, the individual is just one of these guys that was naturally brilliant with technology at his fingertips. Um, you knew all, this, all the, the networking side of the equation, servers, etc. And he was just really, really good and decided that he was going to you know, kind of take the white hat route, meaning he was going to do this for professionally. Um, on the other side, you've got criminals, and I mentioned earlier, um, criminal organizations really have rallied around the opportunity to steal data and monetize it um, on, on uh, various areas of, of the internet, and they treat this very much like a business. So let's jump ahead one slide here and give you a little more details around kind of what this malware economy looks like. Okay, one more here, Ryan. There we go. And what are they after? Um, I mentioned, you know, previously um, credit card data. Um, we talked about um, healthcare data, you know, things of that sort. And, and the analogy that I always remind people of when we're thinking about, you know, whether or not you have something a hacker wants is, is think of it like sort of your traditional cat burglar breaking into a house. If I'm going to go into Ryan's neighborhood um, and and try to break into houses, I I may not know what what Ryan has in his house before I break in. My assumption is he has something valuable that I want to take though. So until I get in, I don't really know. And so I'm going to go door to door until I find an open door or one that's easy enough to break into without getting caught and go look around and see what I can find. And oftentimes what they're looking for, as we talked about, 
social security numbers, credit card numbers, bank accounts, logins, passwords, account details, etc. Something that can be monetized and if they can't, what they then want to try to do is maintain that access to that environment, to your house, to your to your servers, etc. because then they can use your bandwidth and power to launch attacks or launch other types of activities and it'll look like you're doing it, not them. Um, so a lot of good, a lot of things to think about here in terms of what these folks are after. Let's jump ahead one more here, Ryan. And, and Jeremy, if I jump in real real quick there, I think there's an interesting interesting point there too. Is is this this is this is where you start to think about what are your crown jewels as an organization, right? What are the things is, that you have in your organization that you need to protect? We're going to talk a little bit about this that in terms of forming a cybersecurity program. But the number one thing is when you start to think about what what cyber criminals are after is prioritizing the crown jewels and the, and the things that you have in your organization to 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 protect. 100%. That's a that's a great point, Ryan. So we talked a little bit about organized crime being behind a lot of this. And as I mentioned, what they do is they will actually hire developers. They have org charts, they have help desks that you can call into when things aren't working, etc. But they hire developers to create malicious software, um, commonly referred to as malware. Um, then what they do is they target victims. And um, what they t commonly will do is they will use phishing attacks. So they will get a bank of email addresses uh, from various locations and they will launch an attack trying to, to prey on individuals to click a link. And this is how WannaCry spreads so fast. You click a link and in clicking that link it allows uh, your machine to download a small piece of software that locks it and says, hey, until you give me some Bitcoin, you don't get your machine back. Um, and, and so it can do some really, really uh, really, really bad things. And then on the back end, once they have money um, that they've collected, whether it be through Bitcoin or various mechanisms, they do have um, you know, money laundering functions to take uh, that money and make it usable um, versus simply having it sitting in a, in a bank account that can potentially be seized. So there really is this sort of underbelly uh, of, of, of the internet and, and sort of the IT world where we have individuals going out and creating very, very bad software in the same way that a lot of companies, and especially here in the Silicon Valley, are creating great software for good purposes. They're very much is the dark side of it as well. So if we jump ahead one slide here, you might be asking yourself, well, Jeremy, how, how are we not playing, you know, keeping one step ahead of these guys? And the answer is technology always precedes regulation. Um, and what we're seeing is technology has evolved, especially, you know, and, and you know, we're situated here in the Silicon Valley, so we're probably more it's more visible to many of us because we see it day in, day out. Um, but technology is, is always going to move at a pace that is faster than the regulatory process can move. Um, and one of the key things to point out here is um, you can see here kind of who is the most restricted, the least restricted. I would think the least restricted areas should not come as a surprise um, given uh, some events that have happened in the past uh, with various hacking uh, and whatnot. But one of the key things here to, to realize as well is one of the big steps forward in sort of regulation as it relates to privacy is, is um, uh, the GDPR, which is uh, an EU standard that's going to be, uh, I believe, coming effective uh, at, at the tail end of the year. And Ryan, I know you had a little more background uh, as it relates to GDPR that you wanted to share. Yeah, and I, and I, th I think the key thing, the key thing here is to, is to show, show that the, the, the regulations in all, all the different jurisdictions are not the same. And, and, and the, the trick is for organizations to understand what applies to them. And what, we're, what we find with many of our clients, and we would talk about building your roadmap and understanding what, 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 what applies to you and what doesn't, is, under, is, is, to, is to understand where you are currently doing business, understanding, understanding what some of the regulations that you do have to comply to are, but, and, and, and and more importantly, understanding where you may not have, you may not actually do business in an area, but you may have clients or customers from from a particular area that some of these regulations may apply to you, and what some what some of those constraints are. In the case of GDPR, there are there are uh, regulations and and expectations that even if you're an American company hosting hosting your data in 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 the United States. If you have European customers, you you actually have a different set of regulations that that will apply to you than than maybe in other places. And so there's a, there there's a lot of work that has to be done by organizations to understand how these apply to you and what they could do for for you both in terms of your cost structure and in terms of your your organization and, and in terms of how you can communicate that you are protecting your client data or or to to your customers and and, and your stakeholders. Yeah, it's a fantastic point, Ryan. 
All right, to make sure everybody's staying engaged, polling question three, let's go ahead and dive into this one here. All right, establishing a cybersecurity program is cost prohibitive for most companies. True, yes, it is too expensive, false, no, it is not too expensive. Go ahead and log your entries here, and we'll share the results here momentarily. Well, I think we're getting pretty heavy heavyweight response for rolling rolling in here. Well, let's see. So there, there, there we go. Uh, with with uh, almost all the voting in there, you have 83% of you say say that it's false that establishing a cybersecurity program is cost prohibitive for most country, co companies, and 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 we're here to say that that, that that's absolutely true, uh, and that and and that that's that's absolute, absolutely the point that it is not too restrictive to start on the process. And what you, what you, ha what you have, have here is, is, a, is a high level framework to show you how, that, how a program, how you can start to engage, engage a program. And so while it may seem daunting to some organizations that haven't done a lot of work on this yet, and maybe, maybe, you, maybe you, you, you've hired somebody to do a penetration test or you've done a little piece of it but you don't have a, the, the, uh, a broad, broad uh, program yet, what we, what we, our, our Statement here is that it's it's e easy to start the program. So what, what, how do you how, how do you how do you start start that? One is let, make make the co the conscious decision to start a program. To engage your board of directors, and I'll extend that and say your executive leadership team. Right? For those of you who are in uh, CFO or controller or or accounting roles or or COO or CIO roles, engage engage your peers and talk about. The first question, like I said a few minutes ago, what are the crown jewels? What do we have to protect that that are that is of value to those who would who would want to do us harm? Communicate and collaborate with your peers across, across the organization, with the executive leadership team and with the board. Start the dialogues and, and understand that that we do have risk as an organization, and then then talk about how we're going to implement proper governance. There are places along along the chain, at both at both in, in establishing the program and implementing the proper governance, that you you may you may need help from third from third parties, and identifying where you need that help and where you are strong internally is is, is the key. The, I think the key the key thing key thing here is that yes, establishing a you know a, a robust you know cyber cyber program will take a small a small at least a small budget. You know, there there's something going on, but. And putting together a program, starting the starting the concept, will help you help you navigate with the board of directors and the leadership team to get get everybody on board. You may I you may have to con oh, go go ahead go ahead. No, I was going to say, Ryan. Just I completely agree. I agree there. I think one of the key things to take away as well is is realize that this is incremental as well. It's wash, rinse, repeat, um, and it's not sort of the big bang. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna go through this process, and then we're gonna wake up in a week, a month, six months, however long it's gonna take, and hey, all of a sudden we're gonna be secure. Because as the pace uh, and and velocity of threats increases. And, and changes day over day, week over week, you've got to be thoughtful about how your your program can adapt as well. So even if you're taking steps in the right direction, point the ship in the right direction and get it moving is really the key takeaway. Absolutely. So what does this look like? Um, as, a, as we talked about earlier, one of the first questions was, hey, is this just a technology issue? Um, and you'll see on the, the left-hand side of your screen, operations and technology is, is one-sixth of the puzzle. You make sure I counted those right. Yeah, six of them. Um, it's one sixth of the puzzle. Now it's an important piece, but it's not the only piece. And so we're going to dig into each one of these individually. But if you were to look at a cybersecurity program, and if you were to benchmark it against one of the, the sort of leading standards out there, whether it be you know ISO 27000 or NIST uh, 800.53, um, etc., um, it, it's going to more or less map acts kind of what we have here. And it starts with leadership and governance, um, making the conscious decision, as Ryan put it, making the conscious decision that we are going to right our ship and we are going to be more secure incrementally day over day, week over week. Thinking about the human factor, um, you know, we'll talk about this shortly, but you know, how many of us want to click on that email the second it pops into our inbox so we're being responsive? Um, we're conditioned to do that, but that's one thing that these malware engineers prey on. Uh, risk management. Not all data is created equal. We have to think about how we how we classify data. We have to think about what what risks we're willing to accept, what ones we can mitigate, and what ones we wanna we want to transfer. Meaning, which ones should we go get some insurance to cover? 
Um, and then of course, it's once we have an incident, how do we determine the severity and then how do we ultimately escalate potentially to business continuity so we can get back to uh, to normal operations. And we'll talk a little bit more about, more about that as we go here. And then the last piece of the legal side of it, you know, uh, what are you legally obligated to disclose to the public, uh, to your, to, um, uh, to your customers, et cetera. How do you tie that in with crisis communication and, and, and public relations and whatnot? So you can see here, there's really a lot of things that you can that, that you really have to bake into your program, but the great part is, I guarantee you, if you look down this list, you could probably look at this and take away three things right now, just looking at this saying, yeah, you know what, I think we can do better here. And what that's gonna do is position you to start making incremental improvements. So let's dive in and talk about these a little bit more in detail here, Ryan. So the first bucket we talked about was was leadership, and and our our you know supposition is is this is that you're not going to make substantial progress on your program if you don't involve the board and involve the leadership team up front and make make as we we talk about a conscious decision. So so so, while many public companies have already done this, the vast majority of privately held companies, growing companies, even nonprofits. Need to look at look at the board board composition and leadership composition, and make sure that you have the right mix on the on the on the on the organization to to have have leadership that is aware of and and can help you drive forward with with a cybersecurity program. So that may be establishing a, a committee, it may be appoint, appointing a chairperson of the committee, it may be establishing a a, a rhythm for for how often you're going to do updates and, and communication. All right. There is no one size fits all routine for in in the in this space, and what we what we see is is that different organizations have taken different 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 approaches. There are there, but understanding that 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 you, as a leadership team and a board, what your cyber incident response process is, whether whether where and whether you need outside outside experts to advise the leadership team. Whether you need whether you need general liability insurance policies and, and obtaining some some expert expert opinions and advice on that is really important, and and have, having the, the point people identified on both the board and the leadership team to drive that decision process is step number one. That that you you all hopefully can can start that conversation today if you haven't already. Yeah, and I think that's critical because especially you know we're I've seen this more with public companies I work with Ryan, but. Um, you know, one of the key things that's driving sort of the increase in DNO insurance is the risk of cyber, um, mm -hmm. cyber events, and not having the appropriate board composition, committee structure, uh, reporting for management, et cetera, is is driving that uh, as well. So there's a lot of things that companies can do here to uh, to start off by having the right tone at the top, and if that tone is coming from the board and from executive management, it's a lot easier for the the rest of the organization to get on board versus you've got an IT manager or director trying to manage both directions, you know, upward into the C-suite, downward through the rest of the organization, and that's just a recipe for disaster. I think that's 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 the really good point. Is that a lot of companies have have, have had an IT director or an IT leader dri driving driving the strategy in the past, and while that's definitely a component of the solution, it's not the end all be all. Right? Having ha having the right set of leaders who are involved, aware, and engaged in the process at all levels is 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 a critical component of the program. Yep, absolutely. So let's jump ahead a little bit more. So the weakest link in the chain. I I I, I hate to to call everybody out, but everybody who's on this call. Uh, on this webinar today, you are the weakest link. You know, if you think back to uh, to the the TV show that it used to be, um, I'm not going to say goodbye, but you know, we have to look at ourselves as the weakest link. And I was talking earlier as we were getting into some of the details about how do you build an appropriate, uh, a well-oiled, uh, well-functioning cybersecurity program. And human element, I think, is the absolute weakest link. You know, think about responsiveness and and how mobile drives that. And think about when you get alerts on your phone or emails pop up, we are conditioned to want to click on that link, even if we're not 100% sure that we know what it is. A great example, one of the organizations I work with ran a phishing attack. And if, for those who aren't familiar, phishing, spelled P-H, not F, uh, P-H, phishing, is when you send uh, a fraudulent email enticing someone to click on a link, which can then do a variety of things. It can download malware, it can request you to submit your password again, a, a lot of different things. So this organization um, runs periodic phishing tests. Hey, we want to see how many of these organizations are going to click on the link versus say, you know what, this doesn't look right, I'm going to send it to the help desk. And so they launched one um, 
about two or three days before uh, they knew everybody would go out for the Christmas holiday, so about a week before Christmas, and it was made to look like an email from Amazon, and it said, "Hey, we believe you know we tried to uh, to deliver your package um, to the address on your account. Um, uh, apologize, we weren't able to." Um, or there was an issue, something to that effect. We need you to click here and you know log in and re-enter your credentials and your address so we can make sure you get your package. Kind of tricky, right? Right before Christmas, I don't know about everybody else, but for the last three years, I don't think I've set foot in a department store. I've done all my shopping online, which is awesome. So what did the majority of the organization do? 70% failure rate, meaning 70% of the people this went to, which was their entire company, 70% of those people clicked on that link. So if you don't think that you're the weakest link, these phishing attacks, these phishing tests prove it over and over. Well, what can we do? Um, the, the, the first thing that we can do is educate. And it starts with your onboarding process, um, baking in, um, baking in uh, security awareness training as part of your onboarding process is gonna be critical. And then having ongoing awareness. And there's a lot of great third-party resources out there. Um, whether you look at uh, SANS, Securing the Human, um, a lot of other ones that are going to be very similar that have um, various uh, various media that you can either post or share um, and and have uh, ongoing training available. You know, that's really one of the things that I think is going to be critical. The other piece is phishing tests. You know, working with your IT team or working with a third party vendor uh, to launch phishing tests um, and and use that not as a as a means to kind of come in and, and kind of smack people over the head, um, but as an education tool. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this company uh, that I'm referring to had a 70% failure rate, and that was one of their first tests, and they did it purposely right around the holiday season to see what the response would be. Um, going forward, their failure rate is uh, about two years later is now in the teens. Um, so they have this constant education around what do we need to be doing to stay vigilant as individuals, um, and thinking, thinking before we blindly click on an email, before we blindly open an attachment that we're not expecting, things of that sort. Um, and it's really had a profound impact on how secure their environment is based on threats coming from people like you and me. So I think that's a really critical thing for, for people to be thinking about as they think about um, kind of fixing that weakest link in the chain. So let's go ahead and jump into the next one here. And data classification is critical as well. You know, and Ryan's hit on this already a little bit today uh, as part of the discussion, but not all data is created equal. Um, in the same way, if you're thinking about business continuity, of course, everybody thinks they've got to be up and running first. What they do is most important to the organization, and the reality is there's there's uh, individuals and there's functions, and in this case, there's data that is far more important than others. And so what you have to start with is go through and inventory your data. Um, look at what you have. Look at where it's going. And this can be really, really tricky these days because if you think about the consumerization of technology, meaning... Um, in, in the past, IT would procure systems on behalf of the organization based on needs. We're going to do an RFP, we need to get this type of system, we need new doc management, we need new email, we need new messaging, whatever it is. Well, the reality is I could take my credit card and go sign up for Slack or Stripe or whatever whatever new um, you know app or service I need without engaging IT. So inventorying all of your data may be a little bit difficult, and you've got to work with your end users, work with your company, uh, your peers to get honest answers on how they're storing and transmitting data because they may be using Dropbox, they may be using Google Drive, they may be using, um, you know, Hotmail. Hotmail's not around anymore. Outlook.com out through a personal account. Um, there could be a lot of ways that they're doing it. So inventorying all data and then determining what's most critical. You know, what do we need to classify as our most critical data? And then conversely, how do we protect that? How do we make sure that only the right people get access to it? And how do we make sure that we're monitoring to make sure they're using that data in an appropriate way? And that's what builds into this next point here. You have to determine how data is created and consumed. Because if we say, let's go through this exercise to inventory all this data, and you say, wow, we did this, it's so profound, we've got everything locked down. Wait a minute, are you gonna continue to create data or is your company just gonna be at a standstill? Of course you're gonna create data. You need to make sure as your company evolves, you're thinking about how are these things being created and then how is it being consumed? Um, do we need to be doing management reporting based on some of this data? If so, well, should we be cleansing it? Are we using that data to test other systems, um, other new things, et cetera, that we, um, you know, that, that we need to use this data for? Um, so thinking about how we ultimately um, are using this data and then uh, having it used downstream is going to be critical. And so once you build a big picture 
um, and understand that's when you now start to layer in controls. Um, and you want to make sure you're going through the process and you know, commonly describe it as uh, crawl, walk, run, not ready, shoot, aim. And a lot of the time we see the companies do the ready, shoot, aim. Oh, I know my data is here. I'll go lock it down. Well, wait a minute. What about the 14 other places that you're storing it? Should we lock it down there as well? So go through this very deliberate process, and, and I assure you it will be um, uh, very, very beneficial to your organization and will take your, your posture as it relates to security um, you know, up at several levels. And, and Jeremy, I think that's a really good point because, because to, circling back to what we said earlier is that this is not just a technology problem, right? And, and you, your, your, your analogy of ready, shoot, aim, oftentimes what we see clients doing is they're very diligent about locking down a particular platform or two platforms and they, they, they've done penetration testing maybe on their network not realizing that when they did when, when they later come back and do an analysis of where their crown jewels are stored maybe it's their customer customer information their customer credit cards their their critical stakeholder information private private information you know that for a nonprofit it's the big donor information it or, or for a uh, engineering firm it's it's the critical plans and 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 diagrams and you know potential you know uh, new products coming out right Wh whatever it might be once once you've assessed where you're storing those it might not be on the most obvious platforms it might be on a network drive it might be in as Jeremy said in email it might be in um, on laptops on hard drives it might be in different in different places that are less expect less expected than, than 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 one might think and it might be in cloud platforms that somebody did put on their credit card that aren't part of your corporate your company technology strategy at this point so that's what we're, that's what we're here to talk about and the reality is, Ryan, it's probably in, it's probably in all of those locations that you just listed. That's absolutely true, and and that's why and why why we talk about this this, this next point is that is, is that once you've gone through the effort of understanding where your data is and understand understanding and prioritizing what what your crown jewels are and where where they stand is that understanding that your vendors may extend your risk, right? And we used the example of DLA Piper earlier, and that's a that's a law firm. And if law firms can can, can have massive attacks where the, where there where there are loss of client files and data, to think that some of your other vendors can't have that same issue occur as well, or who may be storing contracts, uh, crit critical customer or stakeholder information, those kind of things, it is it is very feasible and by and 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 a, and a potential risk for many companies that that occurs. So. Understanding that that your perimeter, quote unquote, you know, your fence line that that's protect protecting your your critical crown jewels extends not just to your physical location, but to your virtual location where any of your any of your team members uh, work remotely or are on separate and separate networks and so forth. It extends to the Starbucks down the street where where may, may, maybe somebody somebody's working on a public network. It extends to your vendors whether it's a well-known CRM vendor, or it's a law firm, or it's a co third-party contractor that's working in, in your in your office part-time. The, the, that that has to be included in your risk assessment as well. And there's a, the very last point to touch on here is that if you're if you're leveraging software vendors, if you're leveraging any kind of contract that you that you sign. Most of them are going to have some sort of a right to audit involved in, in the contract. What we also find is that the majority of our clients, majority majority of, co of companies out there, don't exercise that right to audit. And we'd like to we'd like to say that if you you could protect your data on your individual in-house systems all day long, but if you're not exercising the right to to to, to audit or the right to look at how your vendors and suppliers are leveraging your data. And how 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 they are protecting your crown jewels, then you're missing another key component of the strategy as well. Yep, that's a great point, Ryan. All right, so shameless plug here for my team, big Raiders fan. I'm excited for the uh, for the season to start here. So at any opportunity for me to inject uh, something about football and the Raiders into a uh, into a, a presentation, I, I, I shamelessly take that opportunity. So you know. This is uh, the operations and technology piece is is on the surface. If I were to approach anybody on on the phone here and say, "Hey, d tell me what you know," just off the cuff, right off the top of your head, what is cybersecurity? This is where I think a lot of people would would ultimately go. Um, and and as you're seeing here, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And what I describe 
operations and technology as in the context of cybersecurity. It's the blocking and tackling. It's getting in the trenches and getting your hands dirty. And it's all of the things you can see listed here. It comes back to once you have done a lot of the sort of soft scale type of stuff, um, the assessments, the data classification, determining what systems we have, how we're being used, now it's time to turn the technology guys loose and have them lock everything down. So evaluating access, making sure our devices are hardened, meaning let's remove all types of things from that device that are not needed to run that device. So locking down services, ports, et cetera. How are we managing mobile devices? Hey, should we be encrypting data? Um, I've got an organization I work with that just spent um, uh, about 18 months encrypting all of their production data. They have so much data, it took literally took a year and a half for them to encrypt it. Um, so thinking about, should we be encrypting? How are we going to monitor? How should we be thinking about anti-malware? You know, things of that sort. So this is re really where the technology guys get to, to, to kind of take the lead in, in implementing some of the tools that are going to help provide more automation around protection. Now, I will say, back to another question we asked earlier, is, hey, can, is cybersecurity cost prohibitive? I will say some of the leading uh, tools for each of these buckets across the board can be quite expensive. Um, so it's thinking about how do we balance risk with, uh, with uh, the benefit. So, you know, or excuse me, the cost with the benefit. You know, if we're going to implement uh, a new access management solution that is going to be cloud-based with all of the right things, two-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera, well, is that really going to offset the risk that we have by doing what we're doing now? And that's really the decision process that you have to go through because there may be other means that are less expensive to achieve a similar result. So that's really where you want to make sure that you're not going too far off the rails as it relates to... Um, as it relates to the various uh, technologies that you're going to uh, potentially implement here. And, right, and as, so. we get, as we go on to the next slide, Jeremy, I was, and, you know, that, that brings up an interesting point is that, is that starting with that prioritization of the crown jewels and, and knowing where your data is drives where you're going to spend your time and effort, right? Is that spending an, ab, an abnormally high amount, amount of time and effort on less important data is you know is, is something that we do see see happening, right? And so we want to make sure that that we advise our clients and work with you work with you all to, to spend spend your time on the on the things that are most important that are going to be the biggest biggest impacts for you and your firm. Yep, absolutely, great point. All right. So then the next piece here that we that that we just want organizations to be thoughtful about is is you know. If in the event that you are attacked, um, making sure that you have a predefined process to evaluate the incident, um, escalate the incident, and then ultimately recover from the incident um, and, and whatnot. How do you have um, uh, a, a triage process, prioritization? How do you know when you should be opening up a conference line and having all the executives um, hop on? Uh, having the right management oversight, et cetera. And then on the tail end of it, how do we have the right post-mortem process to drill in and understand, is this something that we should have known about, should have prevented, or is this something that we, um, that that honestly is just kind of a, a, a zero day, it's a new thing, and we just happen to get hit by it. So something that's really, really critical for you to think about, um, and the analogy I give is, you know, with, uh, you know, I've got two small kids at home, and one thing we, we talk about periodically is, hey, if there were ever an emergency in the house, if there was a fire, what's the right way to get out? You know, do we kind of stay in our room and scream and cry, or do we know we need to get on the floor, and if we can work our way down the stairs, this is what we do, et cetera. It's the same kind of thing here, just on a much more broad scale for incident response. Do we want to create the plan while the building is burning around us, or do we want to have the plan that we can enact the second we smell smoke or the second the alarm goes off? Same kind of concept uh, applies here and something to be thinking about. So let's go ahead just in the interest of time here, Ryan, and jump ahead to uh, to our next one. So so we've talked about the hows and the whys and the, and the pe people. And, and, and what we want to talk, men mention here is that that you as an individual firm, the, individ the, the, the space that you're in may have specific legal requirements that are driven by your customer base, by your product lines, by your types of services, or, or by your, the, the, the types of work that you do, the region that you're in. It's important for you to understand those. So not only is it important to talk to your, to, to work with your technology providers and your, your um, Consulting providers and, and and so forth, but to also work with your legal team or or your other advisors to understand what cyber insurance requirements do you have, 
what disclosure requirements do you have? Do you need to have a specific crisis management plan in, in place for, for, a specific, for a particular type? If the Jeremy gave the example of, of uh, education and, child and, and uh, minor data being released earlier. There are specific requirements for managing it and disclosing that in, in, in every diff different ju jurisdiction. You need to understand what those are. And then you, you need to understand how, what your plan is going to be to interact with public relations or to, to, to communicate and disclose those, uh, anything that does, does occur going forward. So your, your program has to be, be holistic in nature. It's not just the technology and penetration testing. It has to go full circle all the way through to legal and comp compliance as well. All right, let's do a last polling question here. How can you move rapidly to build and enhance a, oh, there you go. Here it goes. Which of the following is the weakest link in the most companies security program? Network and configuration monitoring, laptop and mobile security, detection and incident response, or training and awareness of users? I think we have a, a winner already as the, as the responses are com coming in quickly. Thank you all for being so engaged and, and, and jumping in here. That's really helpful for us. So here, here's, our, here's our response coming, coming in here. 85% of you are saying training and awareness of users. And, and, and we absolutely, absolutely agree, agree with you. As Jer Jeremy noted, noted before, the, the number one thing you can do is make your team, your whole organization, aware of what your program is, that you do have a program, and what to do in the case. So if you're doing doing phishing awareness, if you're doing email awareness, if you're letting people know what's being tracked and what the crown jewels are, your team will start to help you protect that, but they have to know what the plan is. So so how do we get there? Let's jump let's jump forward here. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say just on the, the responses, I, I think that the group really nailed it in terms of not only, you know, training user awareness, but I would say the second most vulnerable area is is sort of endpoint security, meaning laptops, mobile devices, et cetera. The things that that sort of enable your end users um, because those are things that are tougher to get your hands around. You think about a company that's got a thousand employees, that's a thousand laptops that are connected in a thousand potentially different locations, uh, different points. So um, really, really uh, great awareness and I can see a lot of, a lot of good thought being put into, uh, into the discussion here. So, so we're jumping ahead a little bit just in the interest of time. We want to make sure we, we leave a little bit of time here at the end for questions. So one of the things that we always get the question of is, hey, Jeremy, this is all great. I see we've got a whole lot of work to do. How do we start? Um, and what you see here is kind of the approach that we would take. We always say start with an assessment. Um, and this is something that you can work with Arminino to do. It's something you could potentially take on yourself. But um, start with an objective benchmark. We use NIST 800.53 as the standard that we benchmark companies against um, and create kind of a scorecard. I know there was a question that came up earlier. Hey, is there sort of a scorecard that you can use? Um, and I think NIST or, or ISO or another standard is really the right way to go. But go through the process. You listen and assess. And that's going through an understanding within your organization how you're doing various elements. And we hit on a lot of those things today in the discussion. What are you doing currently for user awareness? How are you handling endpoint security? If you have servers that you run in-house, how are you handling those? If you put everything in the cloud, how do you work with those vendors? How do you make sure that they're keeping everything secure, et cetera? And you take all of that data and, and pull various artifacts. I want to look at contracts. I want to look at example configurations, et cetera. And you analyze. And you want to determine, OK, based on what you see, based on what we're seeing, what is the prioritized list of things you should be doing? And we commonly list a cybersecurity score um, relative your company's, to your company's maturity. On a, a zero being you have the doors wide open and you're inviting hackers to come in and say, hey, please take your pick from credit cards we have here. All the way up to number five, uh, very, very secure organizations. And we would come back with a, a prioritized list of recommendations based on your organization, the type of data you have, and, the, and your current state. Um, they recommend what, what, what your future state should be. What are you trying to achieve? What level of security? Are you looking for NSA Fort Knox style security? Um, or do you want to be just small enough that, you know, using that burglar analogy, when someone comes and checks, they see your windows are locked, your doors are locked, your garage is closed, and they're going to move to the next house. All right. So let's jump ahead here then, Ryan, if we could. All right. So, 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 what, what, what? One of the key things that we're that we're going to get ready to close here with today is that 
your, your cybersecurity program should be included in your strategic planning process. This is not something, this is the same as, as now identifying who your target customers are and, and, and building out your product roadmap or your services roadmap. Understanding how you're going to protect your business going forward, given the, cha the changing world and, and all the volatility in the world today, cybersecurity needs to be part of your strategic planning process. So understanding your company in strategies, initiatives, and objectives, understanding any types of potential events that could affect your ability to achieve those strategies and initiatives, and then developing a plan that aligns your priorities and provides visibility to support those key objectives is what we're talking about here today. So, so what, what, what are the keys to success that we've talked about today? This world, the, the world, what we're experiencing today is a world that's continuing to, to increase in volatility, uncertainty, complexity. So, and the threats are going to continue to increase in frequency. So, what, so, so you as a company must be proactive to maintain your, maintain your security. This is not a reactive, what, what do I do once something's already happened? We have to be moving forward and being proactive now. Support from the top is a necessity. This is not just have the IT guy in the corner pr protect, protect your network anymore. That, that can't occur. We also, we also have a situation where you have to align your, your cybersecurity with your other mission-driven dri initiatives, your strategic planning process, your product development, your services roadmaps. You can't do any of that without, without communication, collaboration, and transparency. You have to get the CFO, the COO, the CIO, the CMO, or whoever's playing those, ro those roles in your organization of whatever size it is to work together to think it through and understand that each of your teams ha ha have, have a role to play in protecting your crown jewels. Last, there, there, you can apply governance principles throughout your organization in each of the functions and communicating those roles and enabling your users, enabling your teams to understand the, the, the importance of their role in protecting the company and protecting the, the, the company's livelihood is critical. So with that, in conclusion, what we've done today is examine, examine the, cyber, the current cyber landscape and recent data breaches, give you an example to tie some of the conceptual items back to, to, back to some of the reality. Evaluated the impact cybersecurity is having on several, several industries, and, and we, we see that you know, there's many different players from a lot of different industries on the, on the, on the, the line today, and it's, it, this will affect all of you, from whether you're a large, large public company, a privately, privately held, held emerging company, or, or a nonprofit, this is going to affect everybody in, in, out there today. We've outlined what the, the, the malware economy and typical hacking exploits. We've talked, we've talked about and reviewed the elements of a holistic cybersecurity program, and we've discussed some practical steps you can take to implement a cybersecurity program at your organization today, and hopefully you can all take away and start that today. And we see a lot of questions coming through. Yeah, and, and Ryan, why don't I go ahead and jump in here, and I apologize, we're not going to have time to get all of these, but I, I do appreciate all the questions. One of the things that, that's, that's great when, when Ryan and I do these is anytime we get questions, it shows you're engaged, it shows you're thinking about it, which is great. So if we do not get to your question, um, the, the commitment that we have is Ryan and I uh, will will individually get back to you. So the first question I see here is, is my board members are requesting that I provide data to them via Dropbox or Box. Is this secure, and is there a better way? Um, I will say from my perspective, um, if you're provisioning access appropriately via box, um, that it is it is um, one of the more secure uh, options that you have. Um, box was specifically built with compliance in mind, so it's HIPAA compliant. Um, it, it has a lot of various compliance aspects baked in, including ISO 27000, um, and it's one of the key things that you'll see on a lot of their marketing literature. The key thing that you have to remember, though, is making sure that your users cannot then um, add additional users into uh, a document or into a folder. So I tend to lean more towards Box. Dropbox had a huge data breach uh, a, a year or two ago, um, and, and they do not have sort of the same security posture, not to disparage them. You know, they're, they're perfectly fine if you want to share photos with, with family members and whatnot, um, if you don't want to use IG or Facebook or whatever. But um, I would probably lean more towards Box in the event that you don't want to go to something truly robust for board communications like, like a board vantage or something, if that's a little too cost prohibitive. But I would definitely lean more towards box. And I think the key thing there is to understand the tools that your team is using and help provide guidelines and options to them proactively versus letting letting all, all the team members choose their 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 tool of choice. 
All right, giving them options proactively that can that can be part of your your strategy is is really important. Yep, great point, Ryan. And then the last question that we'll take here before we wrap up today is uh, is a question around data. Um, and is there are are there uh, tools that can be used for inventorying your data or data discovery? Um, and the answer is yes, but there's um, there's not sort of one silver bullet that I would look to. Um, if you're looking at unstructured data for inventory and protection, you'd look at something like Imperva. Um, IBM's Guardium is a good one. A lot of, to be honest, a lot of business intelligence tools, a lot of BI tools have capability of doing data inventory as well. Um, if you point it at a specific server or environment, so there's a lot of different ways that you can you can kind of skin the cat, if you will. Um, but no no one specific go to that I've found um, in in my experience that is is really going to be that one where you plug it in, let it run, and it gives you a full full view. Um, at least not that's cost effective that I've seen. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of direction, um, and, and of course, if I come across something for the individual that put that question out there, I'll make sure I get back to you with more details individually. And, and, and you know, here on the slide are, are Jeremy and my my contact information. You're welcome to send your your questions directly to us, uh, of course, and and the slides will be sent out to the, the all, every all the attendees within 48 hours of of this event. So if there are additional questions there, and, and and we're happy to talk to you about the scorecard methods that, that, that we use internally with our clients and, and how we typically assess that as well, if anybody would like to reach out to us about that as well. Great. Thank you, Jeremy and Ryan. So if your question wasn't answered, we will respond to you offline. So don't worry about that. If you have any more, as uh, Ryan mentioned, Jeremy and his information are right up on the screen right now. As you exit the webinar, uh, please take a moment to complete our survey and let us know how you're doing. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today.